Welcome to the very first episode of Paving the Way Home. This week, we're delighted to have Father Patrick Cattle join us. Father Patrick is spiritual director to Paving the Way Home and also director to Holy Family Mission in the stunning Glencomera House in County Tipperary in the Diocese of Waterford and Lismore. This week, Father Patrick will be talking to us about how being a good person doesn't necessarily guarantee you a place in heaven. There's a bit more to it than that. We hope that you enjoy. So you're very welcome to the very first episode of Paving the Way Home, our very first podcast. And I'm delighted to have us to have with us this week, uh, Father Patrick Cattle, who is um, director of Holy Family Mission um, and also spiritual director of Paving the Way Home. Uh, you're very welcome, Father Patrick. Thank you, Brian. Good to be here. Very good. Father Patrick, would you, uh, would you first lead us in a prayer? Sure. Be delighted. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we ask our Blessed Lady's intercession. We ask that she will guide our words, guide all of those who listen and watch this podcast. We ask that she will lead us to the heart of her Son as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour, hour of our death. death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, Father Patrick, uh, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, your background, how you came to be a, a priest. Yeah, I'll have to give you the, the micro version yeah. of the story. So, is that, uh, so I did my leaving cert in 1997, and I wanted to be an electronic engineer. That was the plan. So I got the points, went off to Limerick and uh, quickly discovered there that I hated electronic engineering and I just wanted out of it. All the while, there was a niggling and it was a very, very subtle niggling, but there's just this little voice that said, look, what about priesthood? It was it was in there, but I, I would never allow it to actually rear its head. You know what I mean? As soon as, I, as, as it would begin to speak, I'd strangle it immediately. Yeah. I just, I, I liked loud music. Lots of dance clubs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, a very active social life. And um, the thought of being a priest was just, no, 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 no. Impossible. Absolutely impossible. Uh, so I was part of a, a, a very good youth group at the time uh, near Mitchellstown. And so I met lots of good young people, young people into their faith. And obviously as a teenager as well, you know, girls into their faith, which is always helpful. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I fell for one of them and lo and behold, we started going out. And that was, that was all going well uh, until two years into our relationship she says uh, are you thinking about becoming a priest and that has dropped a bomb on mm. everything uh, my plans for my life on my college course uh, why on earth continue any of this uh, if deep down I'm actually called a priest I mean she, she was and still is a, a girl uh, of faith so she could recognise something she could see something that maybe I didn't want to see in myself Yeah. so finally anyway I said, I said look I better give this a shot so I ended up in the family of Mary and uh, did my formation over in Rome and then came back working part-time in Mitchison for, for six years. And then we approached Bishop Fonzie, myself and, and, and two friends, Maura, uh, now Murphy, and, and Pat Reynolds with this idea of starting a, a place of formation for young people, faith formation for young people. And Bishop Fonzie ran with the idea and lo and behold, we're here in Holy Family five years later. So Excellent. And, and what exactly do Holy Family do, Holy Family Mission? So one thing all three of us would have noticed was that from working with young people, uh, you meet them at U2000, you meet them at uh, in Medjugorje, or they come back from Fatima or Lourdes having had a good experience. And then they, they think, well, you know, that's great. That, this was fantastic. What now? And it, it's, it's, it was actually <laughs> such a sad question mm. when they'd say, what now? Because you go, well, your, your parish, that's, you know, the place that, that we, 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 we journey in faith, generally speaking, is the parish. But... Youth ministry in parishes is practically non-existent. Even in you know bigger parishes, more affluent parishes, maybe in Dublin, youth ministry is still very, very. It's rare. Yeah. Uh, and where it exists as well, um, the goal mightn't always be as clear as it needs to be. I mean, yeah. is is the goal to bring to Christ, or is the goal just to, just to start a youth group? You know, to bring people together. What's what exactly is our focus? So, we thought, what if these young people who have a good experience. Uh, but want something more, want something deeper, could go to a place, not just for a weekend, not just for a week, uh, but for a whole year, or at least an academic year, and discover who the Lord is. That's yeah. primarily the thing, like, what 
what does it mean to have a lived relationship mm. with the Lord? Because this relationship should animate everything we do and it changes everything. Yeah. So people, sometimes people ask, so oh, is it, is it for a religious life? People come here to yeah. discern the vocation. Not at all. Um, that, thank God, has been part of it. Some have discovered a religious vocation because of this. Mm. But it's, it's not specifically aimed at that. Everybody is called to walk with the Lord. Yeah. You know, married, lay, single, religious, we're all called to walk with the Lord. And I think, you know, Jose Maria Escrivá, certain saints like, like that, John Paul II as well, would have been <clears throat> very a huge pro proponents of the fact that we're all called to sanctity, this universal call to sanctity, and that we sanctify our day, whatever we do, whatever yeah. job we have, that we become saints there where we are. So that's what uh, the faith formation that, that we offer here, that's what it should uh, prepare the young people who come here to do, you know, to live the faith in the world. So to know the Lord, to love the Lord, and then to serve him. Yeah. That's, that's our motto, know, love and serve. So like, like you said, being a young priest in Ireland today, like that's quite uh, countercultural. But now seeing even young people um, actively living out their faith, going away somewhere for a year to really grow in a relationship with Christ, that is very, very countercultural. Mm. Uh, today, more so, uh, particularly the way the last few years are going, just the way society is going. Um, what, what are... What are the, what's the general public's reaction to these young people? Um, are they are they kind of, you know, are they seen with all due respect, are seen as like nutcases yeah, or yeah. you know, kind of yeah. yeah. Um, there's one local shop just down the road in in Kilsheelan. There's only one shop in the village, so it's just called the shop. Uh, so I went out to the shop once, and um, I was talking to the to the owner there, and he said, "How are you getting down? I'm getting getting on down the Lincomer. I said, oh, "Good, yeah, yeah." I said, "Yeah, we're yeah. heading into our, our our second year now." And then um, there was a lady in the shop, and you know how small villages are, like everyone listens to everyone's conversations and yeah. pitches in, you know? So she jumps in, she says, oh, you're down in Lincomer, yes, 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 indeed, yeah. Oh, I heard what you were doing down there. And I said, oh, lovely, lovely. I said, do you mind me asking, what did you hear? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we heard it's a school for the disadvantaged. Yeah. <laughs> I said, okay, well, it's not a school for the yeah. disadvantaged. Now, uh, I think with any new thing, um, I don't know if, if, if this is common or if it's just Irish, but like, we tend to view new things with a bit of scepticism, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, there's this, oh, who do I think they are now? So <laughs> I, I get it, like, uh, but, uh, so there, there would be a little kind of, I think for different generations, for the older generation, they might find it very difficult to understand, firstly, why something like this is necessary. Yeah. Because surely, I mean, if you're going to Mass, what more do you need to do? I mean, yeah. that's that box ticked, so... Yeah. What, what do you need to, to do all this extra, you know, catechism and sure, look, I mean, sure, at the end of the day, you yeah. know, once you're a good person and don't do any harm and then, you know exactly, I mean, yeah. sure, that's, that's kind of it. So then they can't understand then that these people would come here and not want to become priests or religious because, yeah. you know, faith formation surely is for yeah. people who want to be priests or, or, yeah. or nuns, but it's not, you see. Yeah. And you see, Ireland has changed radically even since I was young I mean I was born in 79 so I was a kind of a child of the 80s yeah. kind of thing um, but like just just recently we watched um, what's that movie again uh, not Doogie Howser the other one Ferris Bueller's Day Off yeah. right <laughs> that, that, that was shot in the I suppose the late 80s or something yeah. now when, we, when that movie came out and we, we, we would have watched it here you had guys who had phones in their rooms yeah you know, and had like loads of posters of, of different yeah. bands on, the, on their rooms. Like everything just appeared so yeah. affluent then. Yeah. Because that's what we all have now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? We all have, sure, if anyone, no one has a car more than 10 years old. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true, yeah. you know, and we all have phones in our rooms. We all have Wi-Fi everywhere we go. And, you know, if you really, really, really want uh, a new T-shirt or a new album, just download it off Spotify and, you know, yeah. order your T-shirt to be posted to you within two days. Yeah. So this kind of affluence that, that we saw back then is now commonplace. So... The faith as well, like the, the, the culture has changed, mentality has changed, uh, the economy has changed, but also then how religion, how our faith, how Catholic faith fits into all of that yeah. has, well, dare I say, needs to change. Um, and, and now I think most people agree that a change is required. The, the argument starts when, when you start to specify what that requirement, what that change should actually be. Mm. Because people would say, ah, yes, yes change all the teachings yeah 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 <laughs> change what the church teaches I mean, it'll make everyone happy yeah. it'll make everyone comfortable and that will solve all of our problems our churches will be f will be filled and everything will be great but that hasn't been proven anywhere to yeah. work yeah Do you know and you know the, the lutheran church for example they tried it uh, in denmark uh, lutheranism became the, the state church so yeah. whatever is legal in the state is legal in uh 
in, in, in Lutheranism. And it sounds, sounds fantastic. And there'll be no tension, there'll be no, uh, you know, resistance then from people due to their faith, or well, my faith, you know, disagrees with this. No, no, it's all going to be perfect and harmonious and wonderful. But the reality then is, well, if, if, if everything that's legal in the state is legal in, in the church, what do I need the church for? Yeah. What, 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 what's the purpose then of my faith? Because if, if everything is, that's legal is automatically good and right, then what do I need God for? Because I'm doing what's legal and therefore doing what's, what's right and everything. You know, the, the church automatically becomes redundant. Yeah. Uh, and so that's what we see when, when the church tries to change its teachings in order to get people back. It ends up becoming unfaithful to the teacher. Yes, that's a very and, good point, actually. Yeah, and I think, and this is this is where it gets it gets dangerous, you know, where we think if, if the problems are the teachings, then what you're saying is the problem is with what God gave us. Yeah. So let's change what God gave us, replace it with something man-made, and that's going to be way better. Yeah. Now the the the, the consequences of that are catastrophic. Yeah. Because uh, while we're faithful to the Lord, we have His blessing, mm. uh, and while we're not we don't yeah yeah <laughs> and, and this isn't like this isn't i don't want to to misrepresent god either as if god is punishing us in some way yeah but it, it, this is biblical yeah look at the people of israel like um so they were the chosen people they, they were given god's self-revelation a very very special grace to understand god in in in, in a much more uh, profound way because god reveals himself to them okay and for that then he wants them to remain faithful to him you know mm. to there is one god that's me so all these other gods are non-existent. So no idolatry, please. It's very, very simple. Like the first commandment, you know, uh, and so on. So he asks the people to remain faithful to him. And you would think, well, obviously after the miracles that he worked, I mean, freeing them from, from slavery in Egypt and not only freeing them, but like the, the miraculous providence of the manna. And then they yeah. complain, miraculous providence of the quail. And yeah. then they complain, then yeah. miraculous providence of water. Yeah. You know, uh, and then the pillars of cloud, pillars of fire, I mean, crossing of the Red Sea, Phen huge, huge proofs of, of his love. And yet so often they say, ah, yeah, but we want something else. What yeah. That we want. And even I think, uh, I think it's the book of Numbers where the people start to complain about this boring manna that they have to eat every day. Yeah. And they start to long for the cucumbers and the onions that yeah. they had while in slavery yeah. in Egypt. Yeah. And I think we can be a small bit like that as well, where we think our faith impedes our freedom. Mm. Whereas it's quite the opposite. Our faith sets us free. Now, I think we have to understand that correctly too. Our faith is not a collection of rules. Yeah. Our faith is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And when you get back to that, then you see it's not about, oh, well, the faith says we can't do this and we can't abuse contraception, we can't get divorced and we can't, you know, we have to go to mass every week and we win, you know, all these kind of uh, apparent impediments to, to, to our freedom. But no, uh, while they're all true and they're all important, you can't reduce our faith to a number of rules, not even the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Uh, again, important and valid and necessary as they are, you can't reduce the faith to any of those. Our faith is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and then because of that relationship, I want to do what he says. Yeah. Because I love him, I actually care what scripture says because I, I, I want to know what God's word is yeah. for me. Because I follow the Lord, because I know him, I want to be faithful to his teaching, so therefore the teachings of the church. So everything kind of falls into place after that. But you take the relationship with Jesus out of it. And then what's our faith? Well, you know, I suppose, I mean, you mark certain occasions with the sacrament. You know, when you have a child born, you better do something to kind of mark the occasion. So we'll, we'll have a bit of a baptism and have the session afterwards. Yeah. And, you know, then the, the graduation from primary school, then church, we have the old confirmation. And, you know, then uh, and it, it all seems it all seems Catholic. Yeah. But how much of this is a relationship with Jesus? Yeah. You know, because if, if we've missed that, we've missed the heart of it. It's like, it's like uh, I think, a married couple. And I, I often think of my relationship with the Lord in terms of like how, how a married couple would, would live together. And I think, well, if, if, if the, the husband were to say, well, apparently you're supposed to tell your wife seven times a week that I love her. <laughs> so, you know, while watching TV, she's over that direction in the kitchen or something, just kind of roars out, love you, love you, love you, love you, love yeah. you, love you. Love you. That's me done for the week. Yeah. You know, with no actions to prove mm. it. Yeah. But he, he, he has said the right words. Yeah. He has obeyed what psychologists say is healthy for, yeah. for a marriage. But like, you've, you've completely missed the point. Yeah. 
it's not about saying I love you seven times. Uh, it's about showing it with actions. Yeah. You know, it's about, the, you know, when she's wrecked that you bring her the cup of tea yeah. and the biscuit that you know she likes. Yeah. You know, uh, that's far more important than actually saying the words. Yeah. I think it's, it's so it's kind of the same in, in our faith. If I have a lived relationship with the Lord, it's not just about not killing people because mm. you're not supposed to. There's a rule, apparently, that we have in the church saying we can't, we can't murder people. Uh, okay. But it, it's way more than that. Like, if I, if I live a relationship with the Lord, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be far more, like, sensitive to the needs of those around me. I'll be far more inclined to renounce my will and renounce my desires in favour of another's because I love them. Mm. So there's, there's this thing called grace, for yeah. example, which goes beyond my natural ability to do things because it's a supernatural power, which then gives me the ability, if you will, to do more than I naturally could or would, to go the extra mile, to go beyond what's, what's natural or normal because I have this supernatural power within me, which is grace. And what would you say, Father Patrick, to right, the way you, you explain it there, to going that extra mile, developing that relationship, uh, with with God, with um, yeah, in your relationship with God. But what would you say for people who you know? There's, there's sometimes you'll hear you'll, you'll hear it being said that you know, I don't necessarily need my relationship with God, but I'm a good person because I do I do all these good works. I donate to charity. I go to Africa and build houses or whatever. All fantastic works, but I don't have necessarily have a relationship with God. Or maybe I just go and to mass on a Sunday for those 30, 40 minutes just to tick the box. Mm -hmm. But I'm a good person. I do, I give money to charities and everything. <coughs> what would you say to, um, what would you say to, how, how, how do those uh, coincide with each other or balance right. with each other? Okay. Um, I said, there's, there's three things to say on this. Number one, if a person's doing good works, that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's to be commended. Yeah. Absolutely. Keep doing it. If you know, if you give to charity and you're involved in the tidy towns and you're trying to get, you know, retired people involved by having a bingo yeah. night or something absolutely great i'm not going to yeah. take from that at all that's an absolutely wonderful thing to do uh secondly uh what people might have rejected in their faith probably isn't the truth of the faith anyway yeah. invariably when i meet someone who has rejected the church or kind of rejects the faith and says, look i mean there's no need for her to be all it's all superfluous or we've kind of gone past that um generally speaking the faith that they've rejected isn't the faith of the Catholic Church anyway. Okay. You know, yeah. because if there's, there's this uh, video on, um, on YouTube of One Direction <laughs> and uh, it's a story of my life, right? But it's been dubbed by, I don't know, probably four lads. At least there are, there are four different singers who imitate each of the lads and they sing absolutely horrifically <laughs> and absolutely yeah. hilariously. Yeah. But if this was my only exposure to One Direction, Right, so I see this video and you've got the big stage, you've got all the lights and the guy comes out <laughs> singing kind of like that. I'd yeah. say, they are horrific. Yeah. And, you know, if I show this to a friend, he'd say, yeah, why on earth would anybody like them? Yeah. So I think it's similar with the faith. If all I've been presented of the church is the caricature yeah. of Catholicism, well, of course it's going to look ridiculous. Yeah. You know, that's why I think like what, paving the way home, this kind of mission is so important where we just get back to the basics of our faith. Yeah. What do we believe? Yeah. Why do we believe it? Exactly. Yeah. Because if I just say, well, our faith is here, here it is, it's, it's these Ten Commandments or it's these rules or it's these thou shalt not. No, that's, that's not it. That's not it. Um, I think, I can't remember who it was. It might have been um, Fulton Sheen who said, you know, if I wanted to encourage someone uh, to, to, to love the, the game of, of baseball, I wouldn't yeah. start by giving them the rule book of baseball. Yeah. You know? I'd show them the greats. Yeah. The, the, the heroes of the game. Yeah. You know, the guys who swung whatever important or good I don't know got like 90 guys out yeah. I don't know whatever whatever, whatever the stats yeah. would be you know yeah. uh, you showed them the, the grades of the game and, and, and the, then the, you know different kind of curveballs you know the up curve down curve I have known nothing about baseball but I presume, yeah. I presume there's an up curve and down curve I don't know um, and then of course you bring them to the game Mm. Sights and sounds. Do you know the the, the yeah. peanuts and the 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 and then the crowd going ballistic and you know that's how you get a person interested in yeah. in, in in baseball. So for our faith, you don't start with a rule book. Yeah, you know you can't. You're not going to win someone back to the faith by giving them the catechism. Now it's maybe there's one in a million exceptional cases who yeah. stumble across the catechism and answers their questions and voila, they're back in the church. But I don't think it works that way for many. Yeah. Um, if we want to win people back, I think firstly. It, it'll come through this is a whole other topic but, <laughs> but in order to win people back to the church number one we have to be living the faith yeah we have to live it we have to have a lived relationship with the Lord 
we have to be, you know, people of prayer and people who, who put into practice what the Lord teaches mm. because we cannot give what we have not got. Yeah. So there'll be no successful mission or ministry unless we're living it first. Yeah. So our first mission is always our personal relationship with the Lord. Yeah. That's mission number one. Uh, then I think mission takes a step kind of out of ourselves when people enter into a relationship with us. So like in, we, we see this all the time we say, in, in New 2000 where friends invite friends. Yeah. You know, I came along because uh, my friend here, she's been to two or three and she always says they're fantastic. So yeah. I came along because I have a friendship with her because I have a relationship with her because yeah. I trust her. Yeah. So it's not, they didn't come along to the retreat because they heard it's Catholic and it sounds fantastic. Yeah. They came along because a friend invited them. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I think what's so important for, for youth ministry or any kind of ministry these days is this relationship mm. that when people see that you're you're faithful so if i'm constantly compromising on my faith and then i invite someone to a catholic event chance there they won't come mm. because evidently your faith makes no difference to your life yeah. but uh if they see that that i live it and then you know i invite them along it's it's friendship will and god's grace working in and through all of that but it's friendship it's for, for many for friendship's sake that they will come because mm. what you say there it kind of it reminds me of the story i heard um from the 2008 World Youth Day in Sydney, um, when and obviously the Catholicism is is not predominant uh, in, in Australia. So here was this event, and it was what five six hundred thousand people were. In comparison to other World Youth Days in other countries, it's a low enough number. So the Australians were they were invaded, so to speak, with all these young people from around the world. And there was we were talking to one person. There's one particular story of. Uh, um, these young people going on a bus and they were singing and dancing and just full of joy and the people going to work going what is this and over the space of a few days uh, the people got to learn that these are pilgrims pilgrims going to World Youth Day and one particular man turned around and goes how do I become a pilgrim he said <laughs> this joy that he was experiencing he found him so frustrating the first day and yeah. about the two or three days later just this enjoy this living joy was so um contagious and he just says I just want that mm -hmm. I want that and we like we see it in so many events within the church with World Youth Day here in Ireland with the U2000 summer festivals or these other events it's uh it's it's fantastic one thing that struck me uh there and reminds me um like when we're talking about the you know the good works but you, you predominantly you, you need to go beyond that it has to be a relationship with god and um mother Teresa comes to mind very much so because uh, the world in particular can when when we say the when we say the word mother Teresa, people will automatically think good works mm. good works of which she did this mm -hmm. this is a saint in heaven absolutely good works but people might uh, a lot of time think she's a saint solely because of her good works mm -hmm. um, because she won the Nobel Peace mm -hmm. Prize and everything. But not a lot of people realize just how much like her, her, her motto was, I thirst, how mm -hmm. much she thirsted for God. And even when she went through that dryness of the spirit, um, the dryness of prayer, prayer for many years. And yet the, her, her time with God every day came before anyone else because unless she was filled with God she couldn't bring God to uh, she couldn't serve the people mm -hmm. and when she was serving the people she could see God mm -hmm. um, yeah what do you think yeah I'm just realizing I went way off topic there that no you didn't <laughs> <laughs> you're grand <laughs> so well you're asking about the people who, who say I mean I'm a good person but don't go to yeah. mass and I said okay first keep doing the good works <laughs> so, secondly what they rejected probably isn't, isn't Christianity or Catholicism anyway and then thirdly okay let's, let's actually answer that question and tie it in with that <laughs> thirdly then um, uh, okay, the danger with saying, you know, I, I don't pray or, or, or don't go to mass or anything like that, but, you know, I'm a good person. The danger with that is we're good people by whose standards? Yeah. And, and like, you know, it's not something that you, it's very hard to say that, <laughs> probably not, it's probably imprudent to say that in a conversation. But when people say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a good person, I'm a good person by whose standards? Because generally speaking, it's by our own standards. Mm. Now, if you ask a child to mark their own homework, generally speaking, they'll, yeah. get, they'll get straight A's. Yeah. You know, but when the chips are down, and this is, you know, it's, it's something that it is important to keep in mind. We're not going to be here forever. Yeah. You know, at some stage, we all have to go. Yeah. So when I'm standing there in front of the Lord, whose standard is my life measured by? Mm. Is it mine? Yeah. It's actually not. Yeah. You know, and I think so that there's an onus on us, on us also to, to be truthful about how this works, you know, um, 
that when I stand before the Lord, I, I have to account for what I've done or what I failed to do by the Lord's standards, not mm. by mine. Yeah. So the, the danger as well, you see, is if I, I, I live my life by my standards and I'm good by my standards, we can begin to justify all sorts of things that are out of line. Mm. Um, I remember reading stories like from Padre Pio, where he threw people out of the confessional and stuff. I remember as an Irish person, we find that absolutely horrific because if you did that, they would yeah. simply never come back. Yeah. Never. Yeah. So I was doing parish missions down in Naples and uh, I began to understand Padre Pio because people would come in, they go, hey, Padre, you know, everything, it's, all, it's all good. Uh, oh, really? Everything's fine? Yeah, it's easy. Everything, everything's good. Um, little, um, you know, I'm married, two children. I have a little relationship outside of the marriage. I go, hang on, stop, stop, yeah. hold on. Whoa, whoa. back to that little point there again. Sorry, you did what? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a little lady friend, and she, you know, comes over sometimes, and uh, and I and I said, and uh, what? And uh, you know, little little intimacy, right? Okay. So like it's in proper intimacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and then they use this expression in in Italian, which I couldn't believe when I heard. And I heard this a few times. Like, you know, I wouldn't be fool enough to reject. Okay. Say, I wouldn't be fool enough to say no. Yeah. And then I had to actually, and I, you know, obviously in Ireland you'd almost never do this. I had to say, sorry, sir, that's adultery. Mm. <laughs> right and you know that if you die in a state of adultery that that's a moral sin that you're risking yeah. heaven by doing this not to mention that this side of heaven you're risking the love of your children and the love of your wife mm. for what like you know 15 minutes half an hour pleasure every whatever it is two weeks or something you're, risk, you're risking all of that because you can't say no to yourself yeah and now I, again I don't just for anyone watching, I don't normally talk about that in, in, yeah. in, in, in the confessional, <laughs> but I had to actually lay it out yeah, to him. Yeah. Do you know what you're risking by doing this? Yeah. Because, I mean, because he just, you know, it's fine, I mean, it's like, yeah. no big deal, no one's getting hurt. Yeah. And then you see the same kind of thing, especially now with our, in our digital age, like pornography, for example, no one's getting hurt. Yeah. Right? Or so it seems. Yeah. So, and this, then it creeps into, into a marriage where, you know, uh, pornography, it, it, it's becoming a real problem, but, say for example if the husband is looking at pornography and then in his own head like he's, he's expecting this kind of mm. behavior also in reality yeah but his wife happens to be a human being yeah you know with actual feelings and emotions yeah. and standards yeah who will not do these kind of things yeah. because let's not go into the details like but they're not yeah you know they're, they're not expressions of love yeah they are absolutely yeah. not expressions of love that we can be very clear about but uh, sure i mean no one's no one's getting hurt mm. but but they are because it's etching away at at your true respect for your wife. Yeah. You know, so maybe people are getting hurt. Yeah. So I think yeah, and then go back, I'd say going back to Mother Teresa or any of the saints who are who are famous for for their good works, the 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 grace, the, so like kind of the power to do what they did, came from their prayer lives. Yeah. Because ordinarily, like doing a few, doing a handful of good works is enough. Yeah. Do you know, I mean, if you get up in the morning and you help one person that day, sure, look, I mean, I'm a good person. Yeah. But like Mother Teresa got up and she'd pick the, the, the worms out of festering wounds yeah. from people who had been abandoned on the side of the street, yeah. passed by thousands of people yeah. who thought they were good people. Yeah. You know, yeah. who were, you know, doing the, the, what was necessary, going to work yeah. and so on and so forth, but walking by a dying man or woman yeah. and not batting an eyelid. Yeah. So I think we have to be we have to be so so careful if we're judging ourselves by our own standards. Chances are those standards will drop yeah. to wherever we are, and then, then it's, we'll it's, go. it's interesting because in uh, <clears throat> I think it was in my second year of college uh, when I was in uh, that that summer I decided I was I was really searching and I was beginning to to explore the faith uh, a lot more other because I was up until that I was just a, a Sunday mass morning uh, Sunday morning going to mass uh, looking at my watch knowing there was a hurling match coming on soon so like out the door there you go and, and that was it uh, but yet considered myself a, a good Catholic because that's that's uh, all I, I know because I grew up I grew up in a parish where it was G A J J. but during that summer of my second year in college I went off to Africa and I spent uh, it was two three months uh, living in Africa work the poor I was I was living with a, an old Irish missionary community uh, the Salesian community an absolutely fantastic summer doing great works <coughs> and I came back but you know you had everyone the parish family neighbours were coming back and by their standards you're like wow like almost like you're a saint of a person yet 
when I look at my life and the relationships I was in then, the romantic relationships, everything, and what way I was living my life was completely mm -hmm. uh, contradictory to the faith. <clears throat> but yet, even then, I was thinking, well, no, I'm, I'm a good person because, you know, I'm being told I'm a good person. But yet, deep down, how I was living my faith, my relationship with God, mm -hmm. I was running from a relationship with God because I was afraid what he was going calling me to. Um, and when you do that, from my, um, from my experience, I you know, when you do that, you hurt other people along the way, just as you were saying uh, um, a while ago. But I suppose there is that danger that even from society when society puts you know can put someone up in a pedestal mm -hmm. um and that and yet and you can see it all, a lot of time with maybe famous sports stars and that and you know they might wear a rosary bead around their neck and people are like oh look at what a break a crime example what a brilliant example and maybe a week later they're caught with drugs or you know mm -hmm. a sexual scandal or whatever mm -hmm. uh and it's 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 quite a problem yeah well you see i think everybody has a conscience yeah right and I think if you're living entirely for yourself, your conscience does, I think in time will eventually yeah. kick in. If you're a multi-millionaire, soccer player, or whatever, um, I think you're going to feel the need to do something. Or maybe you might even have a PR manager at that stage. Yeah. If you're that wealthy, you might say, look, give 10,000 to a COVID-19 fund somewhere. Yeah. And you go, 10,000, it sounds like a lot to most people. Okay, grand. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's what I earned half of last Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, you know, it, it makes you feel good, makes you look good. Yeah. Uh, and I think deep down it kind of softens our conscience then to the, the other things that we're doing. Yeah. And this, look, this can happen anywhere to anyone, yeah. so not just for yeah. rich and famous. I think minimalism uh, in the faith, I think it's, it's quite widespread in Catholicism, yeah. in Ireland at the moment anyway, because if whenever I did parish missions and I was talking to people and I, I suppose I have a somewhat rhetorical style where I, 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 I kind of talk to people rather than just hopefully preach at them. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, hopefully that, that's what I do anyway. Um, when I asked him, so what's what's the essential element of being Catholic? So what yeah. do you like? What's the kind of the one thing you have to do to be Catholic? Invariably, immediately, the older people would say Sunday Mass. Yeah. And then I'd say, is there anything else? And blank faces. But sure, if you go to Mass, sure that's it. Then really, sure, I suppose you can go to go to Fatima again. Every now and yeah. Again. Yeah. Like again, going to Mass, please do. Yeah. <laughs> Keep doing that. But there's so much more because the danger is well also for priests, for example. I celebrate my mass every day. Um, <clears throat> I do my funerals and weddings and so on and so forth. So sure, look, I'm, I'm doing grand. But what is my relationship with the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. What is my relationship with the Lord? Because if I don't really have one, the danger then is that I'm going to live my, my, my religious life, my, my prayer life, my vocation, again, according to my standards, which look pretty epic. Yeah. I go to mass every day. Yeah. But there's way, and then like, to be honest, and I, I don't want to bring this up, like, <laughs> like the scandals of the past as well show there's more to it. Yeah. Than just your mass yeah. every day. Yeah. You know, like it does, it's not that simple. Mm. Like, you, you know, you've ticked this box, now you're good as if there's only yeah. one box. Yeah. You know, it's a relationship. Yeah. And if like, if priests, religious, or anybody uh, in, 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 in working with young people uh, if they have a lived relationship with the Lord, these scandals would never have happened. Yeah, yeah. Mm, because you you just you couldn't. I mean, while you can tick boxes and, and do certain actions that justify them and everything else that's going on, if you have a lived relationship with the Lord, your conscience screams at you that you're out of line. Yeah, it goes yeah. ballistic that you simply yeah. can't do this. Yeah, you know. Because it's interesting. <clears throat> there's a there's a very good uh, YouTube clip out there on you know tr the traditional. Irish Mammy when we were uh, growing up uh, and that uh, and one of the clips in it which is very interesting it reminded me there when you were speaking is the you know the mother coming in on the Sunday morning and l let, literally threatening the young fella like, get out of bed and get into mass because the idea is like yeah. once you step over the threshold it's almost like a magic wand yeah. and that or once you do it and even if you're you know at the back but you're just over the threshold you've done your duty so that's it but obviously look it's like uh i guess it's like look, it's like dating somebody you can turn up for the day but unless you're actually going yeah. to engage and try and get to know the person yeah. well you know like it's it, 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 it's a waste of time mm -hmm. yeah. consequences then of that kind of attitude as i say for priests can be quite tragic as well in that if we live our priesthood superficially yeah then all that's important is that mass is celebrated how mass yeah. is celebrated is actually irrelevant yeah do you know just Say the words, or at least most of them, or at least, yeah. you know, somewhat, something close to them. Get the job done and get out of there. Yeah. But the, the, that's actually catastrophic for the faith of those attending. Why? Yeah. Because 
Now they think, well, the priest is celebrating mass that way, so that's obviously sufficient. I'm attending mass that way, so I'm ticking the box as well and doing yeah. great. But now anyone tries to raise the bar and say, look, it's not just about being at mass in the building while the mass happens, yeah. but it's about engaging in a relationship with the Lord during it. And they go, ah, no, come on, Father. Yeah. Come on. Let's, yeah. Not, let's not be exaggerating, no. Yeah. I'm doing as, as much as I can. I'm yeah. doing grand. Let's not be uh, rocking yeah. the boat, you know? Yeah. And that's often where we are now at the moment, where trying trying to bring things back to to a loving relationship with the Lord, uh, it's it's resisted. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. but it's resisted maybe by those who have already um, engaged in a certain way of living the faith. Yeah, I think it's actually embraced by the youth. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of young people who haven't experienced family life maybe like like it once was mm-hmm. you know, the solidity of the solidity of family life um i think they, they long for love yeah and a kind of an unconditional love yeah a love that says you're actually enough as you yeah. are you're loved as you are you don't have yeah. to perform you don't have to have a certain number of likes on, on facebook or for the last post or for your last uh profile picture mm-hmm. you're loved as you are as you are in here yeah what always struck me uh, during my time in youth ministry was um it was like that maybe of the the older uh the older the, the generation you came across was the more resistance there was to the faith but when you came to particularly young people in their late teens early 20s they may not have had any any major relationship with god but there was an openness there mm-hmm. there was a, and a, there, there was a great great openness there do you and again, I, I don't even want to be pigeonholing this because it, I know not, not everything going back years ago was bad. But, you know, the, I suppose culturally in Ireland back in the day, you know, everyone went to mass. And it was a lot of time. And I just saw it even in my own family, uh, the way um, they spoke at times was it was more going for mass so that the neighbours didn't see you not at mass yeah, or yeah. else they'd be talking. Yeah. But it was nothing about what you know, what was happening on the yeah. altar or a bit. Do you think that plays a big part uh, on how we think today and how that kind of... It, it, it definitely, yeah. it, it used to. I mean, I yeah. remember, like, uh, do you know Rhines? No, no, no. No, the Rhines from the middle road there, the ones who don't go to Mass. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And you know them, like... Yeah. And even when I was young, like, um, in Cathedral and Thurlis, uh, even those, like, who wouldn't really have practised, well... Even those who wouldn't really have practiced that much still went to mass. It's kind of strange, yeah. uh, and they sat in a certain part of the cathedral yeah. where all the messers would go. Yeah, you know, but they were still at mass. Yeah, but I think somewhere along the line, as I say, if we reduce it just to kind of if we reduce the standards so low, so that it, then the victory means nothing. I'm sure it's, it's it's the same in any sport. You know, if if you're the only person in that division, and so you get a medal. Yeah, that medal means nothing to you. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like if you're from. Carol or something and maybe have four teams you know what I mean yeah. and you win the county final oh, look, all right. yeah. it's grand like yeah. yeah I mean I went to training twice yeah, yeah. so that, that, vic- that victory isn't going to mean much to you yeah uh, but so I think the part of, of, of the way of winning people back to the faith isn't actually lowering the standard at all and I'm not going to sim- simplify it by, or oversimplify it by saying it's just raising the standard yeah. it's, not, it's not about that either it's not make it hard and yeah. then they'll come but it's to show that the sacrifice that we make for the faith is worth it. Yeah. You know, like I, I have such admiration, like you mentioned GAA earlier, like in Ireland where GAA is an amateur sport, mm. so you will not get paid for this. Yeah. Uh, and now with the standards that the athletes are at, like it's yeah. through the roof. They are yeah. so fit. Yeah. They're so strong. Uh, and then the mental uh, strength that you need as well to, to survive so many defeats because you, you, you will not win everything. Yeah. That's just life. That's, that's the way it is in sport. You can't win everything. Um, and then, like, you know, all our finals replay and you lose, yeah. you know, and you've given yeah. absolutely everything, yeah. you know, and your family haven't have hardly seen you and you've been <laughs> weight training and, and then the, these ice, ice, what the ice, ice bath baths, training yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's for muscle recovery and all this kind of stuff. You go through torture, yeah. right? And then at the end of it, what do you have? You have a medal, you hold up a trophy, you're on some posters for maybe two years. You'll be the talk of the, of the county. Mm. And when you walk into a pub, especially if you're, you know, if you've been on the panel for a while, like there'll be a table full of drink for you if you want it, yeah. you know, yeah. you'll, and uh, you're, you're like king of the village. Mm. Um, but it's, it's, so why do they do that? Why do they go through all of this? Why do they go through all of that, that suffering and torture? Because they feel it's worth it. And it's not money. Yeah. 
it's not money that that that, 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 that motivates GAA players. Yeah. Um, it's not so much. I wouldn't say just say it's it's fame either, but it's it's been I, I think for, for men, yeah, to be recognised and be told by other men, fair play to you. Yeah, that mean that kind of affirmation yeah. means so much to us. Like yeah. So what, I guess what I'm saying is that we're actually much deeper than we think we are. Yeah. People would say, oh, we do everything for money. It's not. We don't. We don't, yeah. actually. Yeah. I think we do far more for affirmation and yeah. for love than we think. Yeah. So it, it, try and apply that into the faith. The faith, yes, it will cost you something. Yeah. But we're part of a team. It's yeah. called the church. Yeah. You know, and it, 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 at times it's a sacrifice, yes, because not everything that we do in the faith is going to win us applause. Yeah. And at times you're there, you're the free taker. Yeah. And you miss. Yeah. And the whole place goes, oh, are you yeah. absolutely kidding me from yeah. that distance? You eat it. Yeah. Like, yeah. They go, you know, but yeah. then now, then 10 minutes yeah. later, another free, you're up again. Yeah. What are you yeah. going to do? Yeah. Buckle? Cry? Yeah. <laughs> Ask to be substituted? Yeah. You man up and get the job yeah. done. So I think in the faith, it's kind of the same thing. Not everyone's going to applaud us all the time. Yeah. That's in the priesthood, it's very same way. So you have to just sometimes man up, get the job done. Why? 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 What's the why behind it? Because I believe the faith is worth fighting for. I believe a relationship with Jesus Christ mm. is worth fighting for. I believe that heaven is worth yeah. fighting for. Dare I say, I believe it's worth dying for. Yeah. You know, and I think, and I think young people need to see other young people who believe that yeah. and do that. Young men especially yeah. Yeah. need to see young men yeah. who love the Lord. When I was in the States, like, in the States things are different because uh, if, if anybody's ever been to the States, when you travel down certain streets, you can practically church shop. Yeah. So you've got the Baptist, you've got the, okay. the <laughs> Methodists, and yeah. you've got the Mormon temple, and you've got the Catholic church. And do you know what I mean? Which, where we go today, you know? Yeah. Um, so there's, if you will, there's competition. Yeah. So the Catholics have had, the Catholics who, who have remained Catholic, generally speaking, in, 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 in the places where I've been anyway, uh, they've, they know what Catholic identity is. Yeah. Because they've had to, to fight for it. Yeah. They've had to kind of... Uh, They've, they've had to understand their faith in order to stand by it because yeah. there are plenty of other options. Yeah. So why be Catholic? Well, you have yeah. to kind of know why you're there. Yeah. Why you're there. So uh, we haven't had that here. Not, yeah. not down south anyway. Yeah. So I think generally the standard was just kind of dropping where we went from being kind of Catholic to, ah, sure, it doesn't matter if you don't believe that. It doesn't matter mm. if you don't believe that. It doesn't matter if you don't pray. It doesn't yeah. matter if you, you know, don't go to Mass. Yeah. Just be a good person. Yeah. And lo and behold, voila, we're not Catholics anymore. Yeah. But we are in name. Or yeah. it's on the birth cert, but... We have no relation with the Lord. Yeah. We don't pray. We don't believe what the church teaches. Yeah. So what's actually Catholic about us? Yeah. You know, so the because it's it there's more to it than just you know, mm. saying, I should look, I mean, I'll have the Catholic funeral when I die. Yeah. Your GA analogy was is is interesting. I remember I remember when I was playing it, and I was only very very average, but you know, you go out in the October, November, December, and it is absolutely <laughs> muck it's and hard, rain. So the, the ground is soft, you've been asked to do sprints and you know, I, I was never naturally a light person so like once one foot goes in you dig into it and you're like, why are you doing this? Uh, you're like, be after college or a day's work, you haven't had your dinner yet and you're like, oh and here you are and the pelting rain, wind, but yes, like you keep going, you're there with all these lads and next thing come the summertime, come the championship, it's you know, beautiful summer's evening, sun in the sky the ground is hard you can smell the the, the cut grass um, there's a slight breeze against your face your face and you're just ready to go and you think you know what you win that first round of the championship you keep going you go on to the final and like everything everything back in november december january you kind of totally forgot about forget the pain <laughs> but you could not get there without it yeah. it reminds me uh, and i don't even want, i'm not even saying this now because you were here but I remember a number a few years ago um, being out in Rome and visiting your community out there and so what I was coming from in Ireland and at the time I was very much uh, I, I would have been very much struggling with uh, and even discerning and at times running away from a lot of the time running away from the idea of priesthood but I remember I was out in Rome you invited me up um, for an evening or two went up and uh, came to your community and I was blown away just by these all these sisters and young priests and seminarians from all around the world I, I the average age must have been in the 30s and that and here and there was it wasn't just that they were in a religious like there was this joy mm -hmm. this absolute joy it even got to the point that i wouldn't even say it wasn't it wasn't intimidating but it was just that 
it was something or so you, you, that I wasn't used to seeing in such a large number from such a large amount of young people. But it was a real living joy that was absolutely breathtaking. You come away going, gosh, like you kind of you just know that these are people who live and breathe God. And it's not just to go in and do their prayers, hmm. but they're actively living a relationship with God. And it's shining through. They're dying to themselves and it's God. Um, it, that, that, that shining through, like the formation, the formation that they like, that's that's ultimately uh, what we're being called to that's ultimately what we strive to but it's not necessarily what we've experienced uh, mm -hmm. wholesale mess here in Ireland and the you know we in, in, come the month of August we can go along to um, you know Ross Cray or Clon goes to do the Thousand Summer Festival and it's brilliant for the four days uh, of the festival but then you know we go back to our and, and and not even I'm not don't mean to be knocking the parishes but you know we go back to our parishes we go back to just normal life and it's like all that is gone, you know, and um, I guess that's what we're striving for. That mm -hmm. should be reality. That should be our day. And of course, like our relationship with God does, it does require, require suffering along the way and struggles for, in order for us to grow. But in saying that, 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 you know, that joy, that dying to yourself and God living completely through you is what we need to strive for. And not just, you know what, that 30 minutes on a Sunday morning is grand or, you know what, I gave five euros to that charity mm -hmm. and that's enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we set, we set the bar so low for ourselves. Yeah. It's, it's comfortable. And I think in so many ways, our lives have become very, very comfortable. Uh, and yet, so just to explain that, like our, 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 you know, our home is uncomfortable, underfloor heating, yeah. circulating these days, yeah. Wi-Fi everywhere. It's yeah. actually chronic. If there's no Wi-Fi, it's, it's yeah. our world collapses. <laughs> yeah. So things, things are so comfortable. But... Uh, but Benedict has, it's probably his, his most quoted uh, line uh, in youth ministry anyway, like, the world promises you comfort. Yeah. But you weren't made for comfort. Yeah. You were made for greatness. Yeah. And in sports, we get it. Yeah. In our faith, we haven't made that connection yet. Yeah. You know, we're, we're made for greatness. And, and greatness in terms of, of faith is sanctity. Yeah. So you're made to be a saint. I mean, do you want to just kind of struggle into heaven you know, getting a, a, a D grade or, you know, barely, barely make the points for yeah. heaven. Or do we want to actually become saints? And see, it, it's not just what happens in heaven. So it's not just getting to heaven. If I live a saintly life, it yeah. creates heaven around me here. Yeah. Because the, the, the danger is with the way things are presented to us now, I can actually become quite selfish yeah. and still justify my actions and call myself a good person. Yeah. But actually everything is about me. Yeah. You know, so my wife serves me, my kids, look, can, can you just move out quick, quick, uh, you know, yeah. as quick as you can. And the, the, the promotion that like all the sacrifices I'm making to get this promotion, who, who's that for? Is that, is that for your wife or is it for yourself that, you know, you feel that you've, you know, you've taken a step up the ladder, you've, you know, but now you're on whatever, 50 hours a week and, yeah. and you know, you're working overtime all over the place yeah. and, uh, you know, you're not going to your, your sons and daughters matches on the weekends. It'll be all right, I'll catch up, I'll catch up, but you never do. Who's it all for? Like the big yeah. sports car outside, the extra car, the second car, the third car. Uh, even, to be honest, even holidays abroad, like who, who are they for? Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it to maintain a certain standard of life? Yeah. Because the kids might just be, just be as happy to go to Bally Bunyan yeah. and, uh, you know, make some yeah. sandcastles because they're just with daddy. That's it, yeah. So at, at times like, when I, I learn to die to myself here, when I learn to live my faith here, it creates heaven around me here. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously it makes it far more likely yeah. uh, that, that I'll get to heaven afterwards yeah. but it, it works both sides where everyone benefits yeah. you know our faith our faith gives us life and life to the full is what Jesus says That's, uh, before we finish up Father Patrick <coughs> what is your hope for the church in Ireland and that's a big question what's your hope for the going forward for Oof. the future of the church in Ireland yeah I think there is great hope yeah. I think the, the, the generation of, of youth that we come across now that, that you've worked with in 2000 as well there's a great openness there um I, I, I've done, done some work with some university students in UCD, for example. Uh, Trinity have come, have done their retreat here. Okay. Uh, Cork as well. So young people are extraordinarily ordinary young people, yeah. you know, uh, who play the GAA and go clubbing and all the rest, but love the Lord and want others to know him. Yeah. Like I see phenomenal hope in people like that. Yeah. Because they're willing to be different. They're willing to stand up and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic. 
and here's why. Yeah. And and they get it, and it actually really means something to them. Now, you put a guy like that in seminary, you put a guy like that as, as, as a married man in a family, like, they're going to change the world. They're going yeah. to change people, because the people are going to start seeing your family is different. You know, I mean, you've had your struggles with your wife, but you all seem to work it out, and you seem happy. Yeah. And while everyone else refers to their wife as the old ball and chain, you never do. Yeah. You know, you always show such such respect. Why is that? Yeah. We pray the rosary together. You yeah. pray, what? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We even pray the rosary together. Yeah. Why? Sure. My, 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 is that the, the, the funeral prayer, isn't it? That they, yeah, that they pray yeah. when they're, you know, people yeah. are dead. It is, yeah, but it's more than that too. And uh, I think, you know, they're the, the, the kind of people that, that they're inspirational. Yeah. And I think in, in the Catholic Church in Ireland, we're, we're crying out for inspirational Catholics. Yeah. And I think they're coming, they're coming online, they're coming on stream, they're, they're, they're discovering their faith, yeah. they're growing in their faith. And it, these things, they do take time. Yeah. Because yeah, there's no quick fix. Yeah. But like, if, if I had to name one thing to fix the church, it's, it's putting the Lord back at the centre yeah. of everything. Yeah. Of our liturgies, of our family lives, of our, all of our various vocations, yeah. of the seminary, of our priesthood. Yeah. Put the Lord back at the centre. Everything else will find its place. Excellent. Father Patrick, would you lead us in a final prayer and blessing? Sure. <clears throat> so we do everything now for the greater glory of God as we pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As, as it was in the beginning, beginning is, is now, now and ever shall be, world without, without end. end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The prayers and intercession of Our Lady, Mediatrix of all grace, St. Joseph, St. Patrick, and all the angels and saints. May the Almighty and merciful God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks so many, Father Thanks, Patrick. Mary.